Okay, good morning everybody. Today is Wednesday, June 8th. We are here for board session. It's 9 a.m. in the Senator Hearing Room at 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. And as always, would you please join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I love saying that. I do too. <clears throat> Madam Chair, before we get going, I want to make a motion to uh, remove from the consent calendar item uh, labeled number two, approve an order revising the bylaws for the Marion County Public Safety Coordinating Council. All right, I will second that motion. Is a motion a second? Any further discussion? Just so we need to review it a little further. So, um, no, that's it. Okay, thanks. Then um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. And now we'll move back up to public comment. And we have two speakers this morning. It's been a while. David Beam, would you please come join us over here? My name is David Beam. I'm a spokesman for disability people in Salem area. I'd like to see if we can get the dances open for all the foster homes in Marion County. A lot of them want to go to dances right now because single law don't have the system there for them to get to get there and back. So I'd like to see that done for families to have fun and get along with everybody and get, and, and get to work and everything else because a lot of them can't get to work because the system's not there for all the foster homes. Okay. And I would like to see that proved. Thanks, David, for sharing that with us. And I'd like to see that get more foster homes stopped and let them be on their own. You want to get more foster homes what? Get them, get them out of the foster homes and let them be on their own apartments and everything. Oh, sure. That's a great idea. <clears throat> I was thinking we need to get that done for this year for next year budget okay that's it thanks for coming today it's nice to see you yeah. nice seeing you commissioner all right th th thank you for um your involvement in the process david we really, really <clears throat> and i'm going to be working with the new mayor of salem on this issue good i'm sure he's looking forward to it he's got a lot of energy yes i do <laughs> <laughs> i meant chris but you too <laughs> but i i want to do is i'm going to be an ambassador for world b State Fair and the County Fair. I'm going to be working on all three on top of this and do my show on top of it. Okay. Well, I remember seeing you last year at the County Fair, so I anticipate seeing you again this year. I'm going to be there and working and make sure everything runs good. Perfect. You can keep Tamara in line. Tamara's smiling about that. <laughs> I see her. Good job. Thank you. Perfect, Thank you. David. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. And next on our list is Mike Riddle. And if you'd come to this sidebar over here, that'd be great. Thank you. For the record, just introduce yourself and tell us where you reside. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Riddle. I'm a custom home builder. I reside in McMinnville, Oregon. Um, and I'm just here to provide a little bit of public comment on the uh, building inspection uh, on site wastewater proposed fee schedule. Great. Um, just basically wanted, and this is just for me personally and my, and my own business, not speaking on behalf of any organization that I'm part of, but uh, am. Um, uh, I guess amenable to this. I think it, it's it makes sense. Um, Brandon and and Chris uh, came to the Home Builder Association at a meeting with with other people who were affected by this. Kind of went over um, some ideas. We kind of went back and forth. It was a very uh, collaborative effort, and we really appreciate their efforts. Um, in the past, there really hasn't been um, fee increases. I think uh, consistently, and so there's a little bit of catching up, and there's been quite a bit of um, uh, increase in, in permits and, and, and usage, but then there's been years of decrease too. So creating some more consistency for the county. Um, and the, the schedule that they've laid out, I think, is acceptable. The other part to note too that I think is, is important is that this is a plan to move forward for sustainability because as of, um, I guess, July um, 2025, then basically the new fees will just go on a on a CPI basis, it'll just be increased 
based on the previous year's CPI. So I think that makes sense. I think it's a good plan. I appreciate the collaborative effort. It's a good public-private collaboration opportunity. So I just wanted to give um, you know Brandon and Chris those those props. They did a great job involving the people who are going to be affected um, to use this. So that's all I have. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks, Mike. All right, that's all we have for public comment. So we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is a presentation on wildfire recovery update from Chris Epley. Good morning, Chair Bethel and Commissioner Cameron. For the record, Chris Epley, Community Development Division Director up in the board's office. So the status of the wildfire recovery at this point, we're uh, at report number 17, 21 months out from the fire. So I'd like to always take you through just very briefly what's going on in terms of building permits. I think what's important here, there are a couple of benchmarks. Detroit finally jumped up to 100 building permits. Uh, and if you've been up to Detroit lately, you see building everywhere, which is great for that community because it was devastated by the wildfire. Uh, as a total, we are looking at, uh, throughout Marion County, 51% of those structures that were destroyed um, are either, are under reconstruction. So just less than two years out from the fire, uh, we are 50% engaged in reconstructing um, the canyon, which is fantastic. And then this is the sewer permits, and this is a leading factor. This tells you what's coming up. So people typically apply for a sewer permit before they apply for a building permit while they're deciding what to do. Uh, overall, you have about 73% of all properties have applied for some level of permit, which means either they're going to rebuild or they're going to utilize that property for some other purpose. Um, but 73% are working toward some use of their property, again. I just want to put a plug in for our interactive map. This map is uh, created through the IT department and uh, with GIS uh, techs. And this map will show you the current status of all building permits throughout the entire county. You can scroll through the entire county, go to an individual property <coughs> level, see what permit has been applied for, what status it's at. Uh, it's just a great tool. It is live on our website. It is public facing, so anybody can reach our website and take a look at that map, identify their property or what's happening in the community around them. All right, and I'm gonna, these are the county-led recovery projects, and I know that Commissioner Bethel has a announcement to make uh, regarding housing, and I'll just lead off by saying that the Oregon Housing uh, Community Service Housing Stability Council met to discuss the property purchases in Mill City for housing units to support wildfire victims. Take it away. Yeah, I feel like there should be some like drum roll or some music. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, I was at a luncheon just as a short sidebar with, um, the commissioners and the DA and the sheriff and the DA was sharing with the citizens that in government it takes what should take a day takes a month what takes a month should takes a year and on um, Friday last week a year um, to the week that we had our very first meeting with Oregon Housing and Stabil uh, Community Services we were awarded the 1.7 million dollars we need to purchase those three blocks on that little uh, image in the top right corner um, in Mill City and it's a huge deal for us. It's the largest amount of buildable land in the canyon um, that will specifically be utilized to provide housing for those that were impacted by the wildfire, um, but were renters first. There's not been a lot of effort um, or help, frankly, for those that were renters in the wildfire impacted area, and so they're still very much displaced, some still living in hotels. And that $1.7 million is the very first step to bringing on about 80 units of housing, individual single family homes between two and four bedrooms is our plan. Um, we're still about $15 million away from that. But for me, this is, uh, the door is open and the CDBG DR dollars that the state received, they received 422 million has been allocated into a few buckets and um, the largest bucket is for housing. They have 300 million set aside for that. And the infrastructure needs to get to housing, which is the final outcome, um, applies to my $15 million ask. And I assure Marion County that I will be the most aggressive person at the table to get that money, because this project is going to happen. And then we will um, partner with builders in the community to build those homes in the future. And the goal is for owner-occupied housing. 
um, that we can utilize in partnership with the CDBG dollars that Marion County Commissioners allocated to Dev Northwest for down payment assistance. So it's a huge circle of success and this $1.7 million award is just the springboard to that. Um, I do want to say on the record, thank you so much to Ryan Flynn, who is the new CDBG DR Wildfire Recovery Director at OHCS. Um, he's only been here six months, and in that six months, he's done the work that could have been done in the 18 months previous, um, and to the Housing Stability Council that appreciated this ask and supported it, because without them, maybe we wouldn't have gotten it. And all of those individuals um, live different places uh, than Marion County, and maybe wouldn't understand the need, but our team delivered. So I'm pretty excited. It is a big lift, and I believe that you'll be very aggressive <laughs> in bringing that home. So, I will be. Uh, moving on from that, septic repair and replacement, um, specifically in Detroit. I know Detroit has been waiting on a community septic system to be designed so that their business district can come back online, which is important for their community to um, have a sense of identity. Uh, the RFP that includes that design has been let, in, or has been put out anyway. So it was advertised on May 20th, is due back on June 21st. Like I said, the downtown Detroit district community septic will be a piece of that RFP through the design process. So that is getting up and going. I want to remind folks that DEQ has uh, grants available for individuals uh, to replace or repair septic systems also. That is a competitive grant throughout the entire state, but it is $15 million and it is available. And those applications can be made directly through DEQ. Chris, can you help me understand the difference between that and the money that we were awarded? We received 10 million and there was a portion of that is set aside to help with septic recovery. Isn't that right? Correct. So, so are we building that program right now for access to citizens? We are currently building that program, and that will be tied in with the RFP to some right. extent. We kind of need okay. to know how much that project is going to cost okay. so that we know how much is left to create that septic program okay. with for the residences. Great. But the DEQ, and the reason I mentioned the DEQ program is it will probably be out and available first. So if you need that help, look there first, but we'll be right behind it. Are we advertising? I'm sorry. Are we advertising this for the state to our citizens? Have we contacted them directly via email and all of the social media sources? We're in contact. I have pushed that out or asked Detroit to push that out through social media. Um, and the LTRG is aware of it. And so it's going out there. Okay. And it's been in our, it's been in our quarterly uh, updates um, through the LTRG and SIT as well. So. Well, we have a specific listserv that was collected through our staff right after the wildfire that is an email system that I think we should be utilizing to make sure they're getting it. Yeah, Madam Chair, it says up there on the slide, and I think it's accurate, it's still in development, though, the, the grants aren't there yet. But when it comes, when it, do we have any idea when the state's going to have it ready? Yeah, no. that's the challenge but, is people are building and the grant program's not ready. Yeah, but is build. it retroactive? Does it allow them to apply backwards? I don't know. Oh. Ours, ours probably will. I'm not sure about how DEQ is setting up their program. Okay, okay. sure. I'm, I'm Chris, this is not your fault, but I am super confused because what we were told from the state is we were going to get $10 million specifically for septic in Detroit. And we have not gotten that. We have not seen the contract. It's just sort of been one of these things where it's like, it's been approved at the state level. We've been waiting for a year. What is this downtown district community septic system? Is that is that part of that $10 million? Did they change their minds about what they were gonna do with that? Is that an additional to the, I mean, what what is that? That's part of that $10 million. And so. And is that is that gonna expect it to be administered through us or is that just from OHCS or some state agency? That's going to be administered through uh, Brian Nicholas's department. So, okay. so he's, he's running that RFP. Uh, he will be working with consultants to design that. And in addition, so that $10 million will include the residential piece and then also the downtown business piece to basically create a path forward for septic for both the commercial district in Detroit and residents. And have we gotten the money from the state for that? No. We have, we've been awarded, but we've not seen the IGA yet. Right. So we still don't have an IGA. Right. But we're moving forward with the RFP because otherwise it won't help anybody if five years from now right. something happens. Correct. The okay. hope is after the wildfire committee that occurred a week ago in the legislature with the amount of um, um, 
testimony that was received by that body that the Department of Justice where these IGAs are stuck, uh, you know, light a fire and move it ahead. There's several IGAs um, from all wildfire impacted counties that are stuck in the Department of Justice. They're understaffed and overworked with the amount of money they've received to IGA out. I appreciate that, but that's the reality. And this project, I don't know, if I, did you want to talk about this project? Well, I just wanted to, I wanted to go back to the, the 50 million we got, 40 of it was for Mill City, Gates, 10 million was for Detroit, Idana, and yes, we are going to use that for this downtown because we know that that's a priority to get the downtown rebuilt if we don't have a septic system that works for downtown. But we also talked about um, using that for further development of the big, uh, the Idana Detroit sewer system for the research and things that we needed to do. We had three things that that we'd like to use that ten million for was two million for the engineering of the system. Yeah, engineering of the bigger system, <clears throat> the downtown septic uh, system that you show here, Chris, and then. A residual of grants that we we could we don't know how much that's going to be. And so that RFP includes the design of the entire system, including the sewer piece. So it's it's a large RFP for design of the entire sort of sewer um, solution through the right. canyon, but it includes downtown. the interim piece, which is cool. septic, community septic for downtown. Yeah. Piece. So well, it's 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 slowly creeping forward. But like I said, we're waiting for we're waiting for IGAs through. The DOJ. Um, I actually have an IGA coming to you next week from DAS for uh, downtown Gates Street project and uh, enhanced EMS service for Detroit. Um, so it's, we're finally getting those. They're finally coming in. I just I just want to put this on the record that we're almost two years from the fire. It ceases to be recovery if everybody else has had to make all the critical decisions by the time we even get a contract from the state. So I just, yeah. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but like this is really harming people's ability to move forward, the fact that this paperwork is stuck in DOJ and just has to move. Representative Evans last week made it acutely aware, uh, aware to uh, the public who was watching that um, some phone calls were going to be immediately made post that hearing. I know you testified. Um, and I have had done some follow-up since then, um, and he, he did uh, make good on those phone calls. Okay. So uh, there's conversations happening at the legislative level, level to try to help these agencies decide how they could be better um, since they haven't been great um, to date. On a positive note, moving, if I may, moving on to the fire hardening program, and that is one that we are in control of through Brandon's uh, depart or division. And uh, as of the writing of this report, we had 105 applications submitted for that through our division. And that provides uh, funding for uh, fire hardening using you know, new building construction materials, um, hardy plank, et cetera, you know, those kinds of materials that can make a home more resistant to uh, wildfire. So that's good. And that, that project is moving forward because it's in our hands. Madam Commissioner. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, is that retroactive? So if I rebuilt my house, I can still apply. OK, yes. great. Thank you. Uh, here in Marion County, we're pretty good at making sure we take care of our citizens from the fire mm -hmm. to date. <laughs> so this is another project that uh, Matt Lawyer and I are working on <laughs> and have been working on. This is Taylor, Taylor's Grove Community Water Well. Um, there's a co-op um, of about 16 homes just north and east of Lyons, um, north of San Diego Highway. And so it's been a difficult project because it's been hard to find funding to help these folks. They lost their community well during the wildfire. We've been trying to get it rebuilt. They don't have a potable water supply as of current. Um, they're actually receiving water shipments as they're drinking water still, um, which, which we need to uh, help them resolve. But it's a $340,000 project, which is a lot for just 16 homeowners. And so they've found it difficult to find the funding to do this. We found it difficult finding funding through the traditional uh, wildfire recovery grant programs because they either don't meet the LMI requirement, low to moderate income uh, requirement, or uh, certain programs will allow for soft costs but not construction. Other programs require lots of technical work and take months and months and months to apply for. Um, and so we have not found a great source of funding for them yet. Uh, we're still working on it and we may be bringing a request to you soon. So. Well, I. <clears throat> I would rather you actually have a conversation after this with me because 
this has been a discussion I've been a part of for the be better part of the existence of this need, and it's been communicated clearly from me to others and also um, to me that Oregon Housing and Community Services will adjust their current policy because the issue that the state funding has to just write a check for this is that a bulk of these owners are, are secondary homeowners, not primary homeowners, and the allocation of funds that they received was to support uh, primary homeowners. And I know for a fact that we can get the money if um, so, I asked for it, if, if we ask OHCS to adjust their one policy to specifically cover this. So I'm a little confused that this is here. Um, so we, we should absolutely have that discussion okay. very soon. We will have that discussion. Moving on to efforts specifically in Detroit. Um, Civic Center, so they had a ribbon cutting, which all of you were at. I, I saw all of you there last Saturday. Um, the Detroit Lake Foundation built a, a building, a community center in City Hall for the city of Detroit. Uh, I'm working with them on trying to get transfer of ownership from DLF over to Detroit and all the paperwork wrapped up. But it was a great event. Um, there were hundreds of people at that ribbon cutting and opening. There was food, there were bands. Uh, it was fantastic. So that happened last Saturday. And for me, it's a milestone for them because they actually are home. Their government is back home in Detroit making governance decisions there locally, which is great. And there's, and there's a place now for the community to kind of revolve around, which is the community center. Um, I'm going to take you to the bottom slide really quick here. I'm still working with FEMA and Detroit on getting their water system rebuilt. Chris. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Um, you know what? You were there, and there was, I think, some 500 people that went through. Yeah. And we got to recognize a lot of people. And uh, one, of the, one of the individuals that, um, in fact, as we took the tour yesterday, staff was up there. We took the tour. <clears throat> Kim Fowler uh, purchased that property, I don't know, it's like 15 years ago or 12 years ago, um, and uh, paid to keep that building going, uh, keep it heated, to keep those floors in the gym. I mean, it, it was like the sheriff was in there shooting hoops, right? <laughs> he, he, was, he was on fire with his basketball hoops. But we just want to say um, uh, publicly, uh, Kim Fowler, who um, uh, he, he has a, a place up there that um, graciously uh, donated that facility uh, after putting in lots and lots of time and money and energy into keeping it going. So just wanted to make sure we did that on the record. Yeah. Thanks, I, I will mention that, um, that he made a significant donation of the property to the yeah. Detroit Lake Foundation yeah. right. so that they could have the property to build the Civic Center on and, yeah. and attach it to the community center piece, which is going to be great for the community. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's exciting that we have people in Marion County that are so heart forward. It is. So, thanks yeah. to Kim. Yeah. So the water system rebuild is the next biggest thing for them. Um, we've been working with FEMA, developing their project. We're at the point now where the entire project is planned and designed and has gone through the public assistance piece so we know how much it's going to cost. It's made it through most of the, or all of the approvals to that stage went back, got mitigation applied to it. Mitigation provides for enhancements to the system to prevent um, similar, you know, similar damage during future disasters. And so it's like, you know, PA pays for bringing things back up to what it was. Mitigation pays to enhance it against future disasters. And where I have that little yellow circle marked is where we currently are in the FEMA work <coughs> snake, <laughs> the work process snake. Um, it is a massive process to get through the federal funding cycle for FEMA. Um, we are basically at the point where we are applying the environmental assessments now. And so it will be stuck there for four to six months while we go through the environmental piece and get clearances. Um, although we're going to keep working on a piece of this project because the city of Detroit has funding from USDA and we're going to use that fund to begin building the building that the water treatment equipment <laughs> will go into. So we're not stopping. We're trying to continue moving forward while we wait for FEMA and trying to time it right so that we don't lose forward progress. Commissioner. Yeah, I, Chris, yeah. I want to thank you for uh, juggling this ball and getting this, keeping this going. I, I do have a practical question. Last year I didn't water my lawn, and it looks like you know what this year because of all the weeds that are in it. And I haven't heard anything from the city on, is there plenty of water? And, and 
can we water our lawns this year? Or you can you can cautiously water. Cautiously water. Okay, you can <laughs> yeah, cautiously water. I fertilized <laughs> yesterday yes. and I put weed and feed on it, and I'm going, oh. I hope it rains a little bit this week because. Yeah. It's not the weekend, okay? I've had enough rain on It's going to rain this weekend no. again. Luckily, no, we've had a fairly insane. cool, fairly wet cycle so far. But so I, just, we're, we're I, I am very shape. grateful for your expertise and your um, guidance. Uh, in, and Marianne um, Hills. You know, Hills. Marianne Hills in Gates. To have that help, Jan, mm -hmm. thank you for finding that, that support right out of the gate uh, to support Detroit and Gates in their recovery process. So. Thank, thank you for, for, I know this is crazy and the whole town, in fact, somebody came, uh, came by my place yesterday and said, why are they ripping up the town right now in the middle of the summer? <laughs> and, you know, CPI is doing their um, FEMA uh, recovery, putting the power underground. And I said, hey, they're not here on the weekends when people are, but there's nobody during the week anyways. But the, the whole town's like just being cut up right now. And so... Thank you for your work. There's lots of danger holes. Like yeah. There's like holes on every corner and they're covered with plywood and they're spray painted danger hole. <laughs> yeah. um, the water system is ultimately gonna end up being almost seven and a half million dollars, which is a big project for them. And, and I'm proud of it because it's gonna end up being a system far and beyond what they would ever have had had the disaster not happened. Sure. And so they're gonna have a 30 to 50 year system out there, which is just spectacular. So I'm very happy about that. Moving on very quickly, because this is taking longer than <clears throat> I had anticipated, wow. to recovery pictures. <laughs> so here is Detroit, and I'm just focusing on Detroit this time, but you see this everywhere. There are homes being built everywhere. Um, it, it, if, you, if you had been up in Detroit shortly after the fire, none of this would have been there. You would have seen none of this. 90% of the structures in that community were, were burned or destroyed. Um, now it's starting to look like an actual town again, which is really great to see. You can almost see my house. Oops, mm -hmm. went the wrong way. Almost. It's right out of the, yeah. Yeah, just off to the right on the top slide. Right so. Everybody's houses are bigger than mine, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the ones coming back are, are impressive. Yeah. So. You don't have a big family, so that's all right. Yeah. So here is uh, something else to show you. The lake is full this year. You have boats already starting to get out on it and RVs uh, filling up the RV parks. And so people are coming back into the canyon for recreation this year, which is neat to see. And I wanted to show you this because most people never make this trek up to see the water supply source for Detroit, and this is it. Um, if you look in the middle top picture, it doesn't show elevation very well, but that actually goes uphill fairly steep, and that's Mackey Creek that comes down to the water intake source. And you can see that it is, it's covered with fallen trees and whatnot, and that's gonna be, I'm hoping that doesn't become a problem at some point, but you know, it, it's, uh, that is the current state of, um, of Mackey Creek. The little dam there that you see is basically where most of their water supply comes from, and that is a hand-built rock wall that just creates a wide point uh, for the water collect into their intake. And that is that black pipe that you see coming out of the water or the wall and then going down. The last bottom right picture is actually a really steep slope down, although once again, it doesn't show very well in the picture. Um, and it just follows, it, it sits on the ground and follows a goat path all the way down through the, the forest, well above Mackey Creek. Um, until it gets to the water treatment plant. And I've actually walked that goat path and it's scary. And that line, if fire comes down and burns through there again, is almost completely exposed and will burn. And it's, it's a problem. So therefore, one of the mitigation projects that we're working on is to actually move that line into the access road that goes up to that water intake. So it'll be in the middle of a road, it'll be buried 24 inches deep, it'll be completely brand new, there'll be a booster pump, um, it'll be much more resilient to future wildfires. So I'm very excited about that project. So, so yeah, sure. uh, Chris, sometimes uh, in the summer, Mackey Creek uh, dries up and they have to, they pump from Brighton Bush, don't they? Correct. So is that- Actually every summer. Okay, so is that set up still? Yes. Okay. Yes, Brighton Bush is a secondary source. source. Brighton Bush is hard because it has more turbidity, so it's a harder uh, water source to clean. Although with the new system that they are getting, 
the new system will clean that water much more efficiently than the slow sand filters did. So it'll be, it'll be a, a very good system for them to use. This is the event that happened Saturday. You can see this, that's their council chambers on the top left, their entryway on the bottom left. Um, you had people, you had bands, people milling around, you had food, you had commissioners, <laughs> uh, you had people playing basketball in the gym, you know, kids actually enjoying that facility. Uh, it was a really great, it was a really great event. Bottom right is mayor of Detroit, uh, Jim Trett and Rich Duncan, who orchestrated the volunteer effort to build that building, uh, cutting the ribbon. And then moving on quickly to the long-term recovery group in the SIT, San Diem Service Integration Team, just to touch on a couple of things they've been working on the last couple of months. The LTRG orchestrated the distribution of 48,000 Douglas fir and western red cedar trees throughout uh, the San Diem Canyon, including in a bunch of our parks, which was great. And then they also orchestrated the planting effort for that. Uh, they have facilitated over $47,000 of donated labor and supplies provided out of the LTRG uh, to disaster recovery victims, so or disaster victims for rebuilding purposes, which is great. Christian Aid Ministries is wrapping up for the summer. So they, they built eight homes this year, are planning on coming back in the fall and building another 10, but they're out for the summer uh, back home with their families. And then the last bit there is San Diem Canyon uh, Wildfire Relief Fund, which was created right after the disaster, collecting money to provide out to victims. Uh, their original goal was $4 million. It is now $5 million, because they've collected more than their goal and are continuing to collect funding to bring in and send back out, which once again shows you how heart forward people are in helping uh, bring the San Diem Canyon back to life. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. That's a great report. Sorry that it took so long. Um, don't be sorry. I think mm -hmm. uh, I think we reduced your amount of time when you were coming. The frequency that you're sitting in front of us, showing the community this at work, and it's worthy information. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Okay, now we will move on to consent. Commissioner Willis, would you please move the consent calendar? Um. <clears throat> Uh, well, did we? Just, we just did. one item. Just the second item. Item number three. We already pulled. Did folks already yep. give public comment? Did that. Okay. And Madam Chair, I'd move that we approve an order establishing a fee schedule for the administration and enforcement of the Marion County on site wastewater program as administered by Marion County Building Inspection. I'll second the motion. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. I was just going to say thanks to Mike, but he already headed out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And now we will move to action items. And I just want to state for the record that the alphabet is backwards today, but probably because the sheriff's office doesn't want to sit through the myriad of <laughs> business services that we're going to talk about. So, yes, um, under the sheriff's office, we're going to consider approval of the incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the city of Aurora in the amount of $213,129 to provide patrol services for the city from July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Commander. Good morning. Good Jeff morning. Stubbard with the Sheriff's Office, Enforcement Commander. Um, I appreciate you guys allowing me to go before finance. That was quite a list and I'm not going to take up near as much time <laughs> as, as the previous one. Uh, but I want to start off with the uh, City of Aurora contract. Um, and request the board consider approval uh, to renew this contract for another year to provide police services to the city. Um, this has actually been a contract that we've had since about 2016. Currently we have uh, Deputy Walker assigned to work in the city. Uh, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for that deputy in the community to really get to know each other. Um, the deputy to learn the specific challenges and uh, needs of the community. They have that one direct contact person. Um, and it's not, it's not just policing, it's, it's community engagement and outreach. It's, it's really integrating into the community. Um, you know, the city of Aurora has Highway 99 going through it, so it allows them the opportunity to work on some of the traffic safety issues, traffic enforcement, um, and not only do they provide the funds for one deputy, but they get all the resources of the sheriff's office that come with that. So in the unfortunate uh, circumstance that something big happens, 
We have search and rescue, we have detectives, we have all of our resources that come with that. Um, and so we believe that it's a, it's a really good deal for the community, uh, as well as the sheriff's office, because we get to dedicate a deputy to that community that, you know, it's up at the north, north end of the county that otherwise wouldn't necessarily get the dedicated um, coverage that they get now. So with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, here you go. All right, okay. would you please make the uh, Madam Chair, I'll move that we approve incoming funds in our government agreement with the City of Aurora in the amount of 213129 to provide patrol services for the city from July 1st, 22 to June 30th, 2023. I'll second the motion. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Um, and before we move on, I just want to let those of you know who were here for the public hearing that was going to begin at 930. As soon as we complete our business, we will move on to that item. So it'll be just a few more minutes. Now we're going to move on to consider approval of the incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the city of Jefferson in the amount of $396,659 to provide law enforcement patrol services within the city from July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. And again, I'm still Jeff Stoutrud with the Sheriff's <laughs> Office. Um, and again, we're, I'm here to ask uh, the board to consider approval for this long-standing contract with the City of Jefferson. I think it dates back to the late 90s. Uh, I remember as a reserve deputy in the late 90s and then a recruit deputy working with uh, Sheriff Cass down there when I was in training. Uh, when he was assigned to the contract. So very, very long-standing contract. You know, a lot of the same uh, abilities. We currently have Deputy West and Deputy Kittleson assigned to that contract. Um, you know, every community has their unique challenges and, and needs. Jefferson is no different. Uh, but again, it allows the deputies to really dive in and connect with the community, start working with them directly and, and meeting those needs. Um, the other thing that I want to add to this one is the City Council, Jefferson City Council, over the last probably six and eight months, have uh, there have been talk about adding a third deputy position to that contract. And they held a series of community meetings uh, over the last several months um, and voted to add a third deputy. So we're currently working with the city on finalizing some of those details and then seeing when that implementation will happen. Um, but we're excited about that. I think it's needed. Um, you know, Jefferson's a, a community with uh, some needs that I think a, dirt, a third deputy position will really benefit them and what they're needing. So, um, you know, they have a lot of the same challenges with the highway going right through their traffic, the schools. Um, there's, it's a busy little community. Thank you. Any questions? No. Nope. Okay, hearing that, then Commissioner, would you please make the motion? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the City of Jefferson in the amount of $396,659 to provide law enforcement patrol services within the city from July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2022. <coughs> I'll second the motion. A motion and a second for further discussion. <coughs> hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thanks, Commander. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to move on to action items under Board of Commissioners to consider approval of the American Rescue Plan ARPA subrecipient agreements with cities located within Marion County for the following projects retroactive to March 3rd, 2021 through December 31st, 2026. The City of Almsville for the wastewater system project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Donald for the new City Drinking Wells project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Gates for the Water System Improvements Project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Jervis for the Wastewater Pump Station Forced Main and Aeration Upgrade Project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Hubbard for the waste, excuse me, Water System Improvements Project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Jefferson for the Water Treatment Plant Excess Recirculation System Project in the amount of $450,000. The City of Mill City for the Sewer Improvements Project in the amount of $1 million. The City of Mount Angel for the Markham Sanitary Sewer Trunk Line Project in the amount of $450,000. The City of St. Paul for the Water System Improvement Plan Project in the amount of $1,000,000. The City of Staten for the Ida Street Sanitary Sewer Pipe Construction Project in the amount of $500,000. The City of Sublimity for the Water System Improvements Project in the amount of $1,000,000. 
the city of Turner for the lower water booster pump station project in the amount of 200,000. And last but not least, the city of Turner for the source water integration study overage Turner storm drain project in the amount of $450,000. <laughs> Yeah, and nobody else has to read that twice, so there you go. <laughs> Debbie. Good morning. Good Debbie morning. Gregg, uh, Grants Manager, Finance Department. Camber Schlag, uh, Contracts and Procurement Manager in the Finance Department. Chris Etley, uh, What are you? Creative Development Director, Division Development Director, Okay. Well, I'll, I'll lead this yeah, off. Yeah, you keep going. I'll, I'll Maybe lead this John off. can come out here and change the batteries. Uh, <laughs> difficulties, yeah. So, good morning. Yes, we are here to present the 13 uh, American Rescue Plan award agreements to the cities that you succinctly <laughs> just described. Thank you. Do you need a drink of water? That was great. I, I did. I, I got <laughs> We happy. had to bring three people because it was so many <laughs> to split it up. So, excellent job. Um, no, but this morning, we're, uh, these are specifically for the water sewer broadband infrastructure projects um, that are allowable under the ARPA, um, award, uh, the ARPA award that we've received. And just to recap, in case anybody's missed it, uh, Marion County was directly allocated over $67 million in ARPA funds, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery. And as a result of an application process that we had, uh, the Board of Commissioners awarded these funds um, back in late January, and now we're executing all those agreements. And as you can see, we have a map here that kind of shows the breadth of the awards that the commissioners um, have allocated across the entire county. And um, over the last two weeks, um, the board's approved 12 agreements, um, various agreements and memorandum of, of understanding for over 35 million. And this morning, uh, we would like you to consider approving uh, the infrastructure agreements, um, all 13 of them for about 10, over a little over 10 million. So um, we'll go through quick and kind of describe each of the various uh, contracts and agreements and projects and um, and yeah so uh, the first one again as you mentioned is a million dollar to the city of Omsil for some engineering costs associated with a wastewater treatment system a million dollars to the city of Donald for the new drinking wells and water plant improvements a million dollar to the city gates uh, for water system improvements that's installing water main pipes and replacing some PEX piping. Sorry, not my area of expertise. <laughs> it's just called PEX. PEX, thank you. Uh -huh. Excellent. Plumber's <laughs> um, wife. Yeah, I'm a plumber's wife. Oh, sweet. A <laughs> um, million dollars to the city of Jervis for some upgrades to their uh, wastewater pump <clears throat> station, force main, and lagoon aeration uh, system. Turn over to Camber. Okay. And I'm going to start with a million dollars to the city of Hubbard for the water system improvements project only for phase one. $450,000 to the city of Jefferson for the water treatment plant excess recirculation system, which includes design permits, equipment, and piping construction. $1 million to the city of Mill City for sewer improvements to their wastewater treatment facility. This includes design permits, construction, and capacity improvements. And finally, $450,000 to the City of Mount Angel for the Marquam Sanitary Sewer Trunk Line Project. And now I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. And I'll be presenting to you the City of St. Paul for their Water System Improvement uh, Plan Project in the amount of a million dollars. This is the first phase of, their, uh, of a much larger project and includes a 500,000 gallon above ground storage tank and tying it into their existing system to improve storage and pressures throughout town. City of Staten uh, for a uh, sanitary sewer pipe construction project in the amount of 500,000 and this project will increase the capacity of a sewer transmission main in one of the city's sewer basins allowing development to continue in this part of town which is otherwise not able to continue uh, until this is completed. The city of Sublimity uh, for a water system improvement project in the amount of a million dollars and this project includes the construction of a 750,000 gallon above ground storage tank um, tying it in with a SCADA system, which is a, a telemetry, a automatic telemetry system, allows the tank and all of the wells to talk and work with one another. Um, and this is needed uh, to support growth and stabilize pressures throughout town. And the city of Turner is getting two projects. Uh, the first is a booster pump station project in the amount of $200,000, which is GAP funding. It's a, it's a $1.2 million project that they have a million dollars shared between them and the city of Salem for. 
uh, and this will provide a permanent housing for a water booster pump and implement uh, necessary algae toxin safeguards for safe drinking water requirements. And then also the city of Turner uh, for a source uh, water integration study uh, project in the amount of $450,000. This project will um, construct improvements to help prevent localized flooding uh, through their stormwater system. So. Thank you. Thank you. That summarizes our presentation. So if you have any questions? I don't have any answer. questions. I just want to say that um, while this is, I think it's our third and final presentation from your team on the ARPA allocations. And while every project is uh, very uh, unique and important, today's allocation, I feel, is um, the most critical to our community. One of the things that Marion County is supposed to do is to uh, create um, opportunities for safe, healthy living environments for all of our citizens. And we have the most incorporated cities of any county in the state, which means our need is greater because they always have great needs. And I'm just super proud of the fact that we have allocated such a significant portion of these federal dollars to our cities, 10 specifically today, which is half. Um, but we, I was just counting the dots on that map and there's 30 dots. There's only 21 cities. Um, we did a really good job with the communication, I believe, through um, our partnerships in economic development, having cities come to us and talk to us about their needs, what they were going to utilize their ARPA dollars for, and just trying to stretch these dollars as far as possible in those collaborative discussions because they're also bringing dollars to the table for these projects. And frankly, a lot of these cities would not be able to, I think, move ahead today if it wasn't for these funds because there's just not money out there hanging for them to go grab um, and also the state makes it incredibly difficult for small entities to access funds um, to do what they need to do while they regulate the heck out of them they don't actually write them a check to follow those regulations so I just want to say good job to our team um, but mostly to your team. <laughs> you guys have done a ton of work, and I am sure I have no idea the depth of paperwork and fishing that you're doing through the ponds of these applications and grant allocations, but thank you. Thank you. So, do I add anything? No, I think you got it all right. Yeah. Madam okay. Chair, before I make the motion, um, I just want to uh, reiterate how we approach this, and um, yeah. I think Commissioner Willis was talking about how long it's taken to get some <laughs> contracts done. <laughs> I want to thank legal counsel and uh, all the work that they've been doing, even though they seem to be short staffed at times. It doesn't seem like it, right? I yeah. mean, I want to thank you publicly for the work you're, you and your team have been doing. And then the other thing is, is that we said right at the beginning, we wanted these investments to be uh, generational for our kids and our grandkids. And you can see by all this infrastructure money that's going out there, um, that's what, what's happening. So I'm, I'm really thankful for that. So, and if you're ready for a motion, I will move it. I am ready. Okay, Madam Chair, I'll just move. Um, we've already, you've already said all of the projects, <laughs> so I'll move that we approve the American Rescue Plan Act sub recipient agreements with cities located in Marion County on the projects that are listed retroactive to March 3rd, 2021 through December 31st, 2026. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. <clears throat> and for further the discussion as I was reading through this list, I just want to give kudos to the city of Jefferson. They actually built a water plant, a water treatment plant. Um, they set up a plan several years, I feel like a decade ago. Um, they worked with a local um, accountant in their community to kind of create a fund that they they set aside. And these this four hundred fifty thousand dollars, well, isn't that much? It totally gets them over the hurdle to the finish line of their need. And I'm just really proud of a city that size to be able to to kick off a task as big as they did and get it to completion. And if you're bored and you don't know what a water facility looks like, drive to Jefferson and tour it. We did, and I thought it was super fascinating. So State good job, Jefferson. Yeah. yeah. So if there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you all for your work. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm just going to leave the Okay. Yeah, you you? Okay. I'm going to open a public hearing. 
It is 9.50 a.m. Uh, the public hearing is continued from January 12, 2022 to consider a zone change comprehensive plan amendment ZCCP case number 21-005 Enchanted Ridge Property Owners Association. If Lindsay King would please come forward. Oh, waiting for Commissioner Cameron. No, no, please okay. go. Okay. <laughs> There's speakers in the restroom. <laughs> it's like going to a game. You can just listen overhead. <laughs> uh, good morning, Commissioners. For the record, this is Lindsay King, Marion County Planning. The item before you today is a continuation of a hearing on an application to change the comprehensive plan designation from primary agriculture to rural residential and the zone from exclusive farm use to acreage residential on approximately 7.29 acres of an 85.6 acre parcel located at the 2700 block of Enchanted View Lane, Southeast Salem. The hearings officer first heard this case on July 29th of 2021 and issued a recommendation of approval. The case was then brought to the Board of County Commissioners on January 12th of 2022 and remanded back to the hearings officer for further consideration at the request of the applicant to provide additional evidence and arguments. On May 26th of 2022, the hearings officer issued a recommendation of approval. The applicant has revised their argument for the goal three exception from the reasons exception to irrevocably committed. The applicant provided additional evidence for why it is committed, which includes the location of the proposed residential lots in relation to farmable lands. Currently, the configuration of the lots do not allow for practical farming practices. Some of the issues identified are topography, location, access, and neighboring uses. The hearings officer report states that the exceptions area have become increasingly isolated by adjacent development. The hearings officer also discussed that the parcels are no longer in common ownership as it has been in the past. This lack of connection represents further change in the relationship between the exception area the farm parcel and the surrounding areas. Staff agrees with the hearings officer recommendation, except staff recommends that the condition that the future zone change on the larger remainder parcel be tied to a legislative process, which is mentioned on page two, number five of the hearings officer decision, be taken out and instead the exi existing goal exception process would continue to be available to that property. The board has the options of continuing the public hearing close the hearing and leave the record open, close the hearing and approve, modify, or deny the request, or remand back to the hearings officer. Staff recommends that the board approve the zone change comprehensive plan amendment, excluding the condition for a legislative amendment in the hearings officer recommendation. I'll stand for any questions you might have. So um, can you bring my attention to what you are referring to as far as mm -hmm. the staff's recommendation except? So uh, on the hearings officer decision on the second page, excuse me, third page. Okay. Wait. Second page. My apologies. I highlighted way too much stuff on my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second page where it says uh, five executive summary. In the second paragraph, um, it talks about. It says the um, hearings officer recommends approval of the application with a condition of approval that includes a restrictive covenant on the farm parcel. That's specifically what we're referring to. Okay. And okay. What, what's your recommendation instead? Uh, to remove that. And, and okay. And you said that you would you recommend removing that. What was the second half of what you stated? You had something about the legislative the ordinance. Staff recommends removing that condition, which is uh, that parcel be tied to a legislative process, instead still allowing it to use the existing goal exception process, which is what we're going through today. And when you say a legislative process, what what do you mean a legislative process? A restrictive um, covenant. I'll re, I'll, I'm going to refer to the applicant on that one that it was one of their suggestions. Okay. Okay. 
So Sorry. Then we'll, how about we just move to your presentation and maybe it'll clear it up. Very good. For the record, please introduce yourself. For the record, uh, my name is Mark Shipman. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the, of the board. Uh, Mark Shipman, land use attorney with Sawfield Griggs, 250 Church Street, Southeast, Suite 200, Salem, Oregon, 97302. Here this morning on behalf of the Enchanted... Can you pull the microphone either up or closer to you so it... Do I need to push? If it's not lit up, then we want it to light up. Okay. Uh, here this, uh, on behalf of the Enchanted Ridge Property Owners Association, they're the applicant for this, uh, for this combined application. Um, we have no procedural objections. Uh, substantively, uh, I want to thank you for remanding this back to the hearings officer. I think this enabled us to revise our proposal, make it streamlined, clean up the findings, uh, clarify what we were asking for, and give us time to work with staff uh, and the hearings officer to get the recommendation that you have before you this morning. Um, we believe the hearings officer came to the right conclusion and recommendation again, uh, but this time uh, in finding that the applicant satisfies all the criteria for the zone change, the comprehensive plan change, and for the exceptions to uh, goals 3 and 14. Uh, we initially had requested uh, that there be a restrictive covenant placed as a condition of approval. So dating back thinking that that would be a great idea to put up some sideboards with respect to, I think, the concern that I think planning staff had and I think maybe neighbors. I know that DLCD had concerns that that this request could just be an erosion with respect to the the parent the, the farm parcel, the main parcel. And, and so I thought restrictive covenant would be great. But Brandon uh, came back to us uh, earlier this week and just said, I, I really thought, rethought this because the restrictive covenant is a civil matter. And it would be really bad if Marion County goes, wants to go through a process, let's say 10, 15 years down the road, where you want to change more rural land from resource into rural residential. And let's say you wanted to pick this property and you wanted to have this property go through the legislative process, which is a process that the board initiates, okay, through the, through the staff, through the planning commission, ultimately to the board. It would essentially allow you to do that, but it would prohibit, someone could enforce that covenant and say, no, you can't do that on this property. Mm -hmm. And so Brandon caught that and he just said, Mark, I don't think this is a good idea. I think what we should do is we should just rely on the goal exception process. Th this process is, is onerous enough, as you can see from the time and the, and the amount of time that we've put into this thing. It, it, that process in itself is sufficient sideboards to ensure that there's no, there's no slippage. We're not on a slippery slope with respect to the, the, the remnant farm par parcel. So we agree with staff on removal of the condition of approval, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, I would requ uh, respectfully request that you close the hearing, you approve uh, the combined applications and uh, as recommended by staff. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the application uh, at this time. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions, Commissioner? I just have, I guess, a comment. Um, this seems super reasonable to me. I mean, it, this just this whole process seems super reasonable to me. We're we're basically carving out three new places for homes, right? Isn't that the the number of home sites that would result from this? Three three new home sites, and these are home, these are sites that that can't be farmed, and that's the key thing, Commissioner right. Wills. Is that is that you know you just don't get to carve off parcels off your, off your farm piece um, in EFU zone uh, unless you can meet the exceptions criteria. And we met both the goal three and the goal 14 exceptions. And, and I think the, that we showed that it, it is impracticable, um, both through the letters from, from Amy Dorfler and from the tenant farmer with respect to how these, what I call the gap portions, are not, they're not practically able to be farmed. That's a, that's a hard word to say. And that's the difference, and, th and that's why I believe this is such a compelling application. It's a unique property, unique location, and you just don't see these. You don't come across these every day. And that's different from the rest of the 77 or 78 acres, right? Absolutely. Because that can be farmed, and it, so there's it, no need for any restrictive covenant because this process wouldn't apply to that. No need for a restrictive covenant. You know, the only way that that process is going to get passed is, is if Marion County initiates a legislative process, honestly. There, no, no sane person would want to go through uh, an applicant-initiated application to try to, to get that uh, committed uh, or, or call it committed to, uh, to uses other than farm. It just, it just doesn't pass the blush test. So, so currently, the 77 or 78 acres is being farmed. Yes. And these 
these three parcels, so I guess it'd be like six acres, is not being farmed, right? Because it they're can't being, be farmed. It, it's not, it's, they're, they're being, I would use the word they're being maintained um, because the, the homes, you've got homes both north and south of these, of these gap properties, you know, and in this rural area. And so they have to be, those properties have to be maintained. Otherwise, you would have, their, they would be at risk for potential fire danger. Um, and, and I know that the, the neighbors are concerned about the, the potential risks to the current houses. And so if we approve this, essentially we're not making any changes. We're just recognizing what already exists, which is there's, there's a piece of this land that can't be farmed, and we're just recognizing that and we're allowing people to build a couple of homes. Yeah, and the reality is is that Marion County recognized this back in 1973 okay. when when the, the former owners got approval to do that the, the 40 lot subdivision and then they scaled it way back. We're just essentially coming in and asking for three more parcels where, where as you said, it makes sense. It's very reasonable, it makes sense, it fits in with the, with the neighborhood, the community, and um, uh, and we still have more processes to go. We still have to go through a partition process. We still have to do a geotech study to ensure that there's um, that there's sufficient water in the area. So, so the 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 property owner isn't done with that process. This is this is the biggest process. This is the most important process and the most difficult to get through. And I believe that we can get through this, and then we can move on to the to the next land use applications. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Mark. Um, just to determine, I only have one individual signed up for um, public comment. Is there anybody else? If I mean, still sign up, um, Dale Abraham, if you'd please join us over here. Yeah. No, Lindsay, you go. Dale, you come. <laughs> yep, over here, please. <laughs> yeah, you're doing a great job. Good morning. And for the Good record, morning. would you please share your name and address? Uh, Dale Abraham, 2918 Maranatha Court, Southeast, and Turner address. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess I'm confused after what he just said, um, which I didn't count on. They still have to go through a uh, water test to make sure they have enough water? Isn't that what he just said? I, That's what it sounded like, yeah. 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 So. That would be before they could build. I'm sorry, what? That would be before they could build. Right. Yeah. So the reason that we're, I'm here, and, and Ken, if he wants to talk, is the fact that we don't believe there's enough water. So I'm, I'm baffled. Well, we're um, just here today to talk about just the land separation, and then whatever comes next, comes next, and that's through well, those processes. Well, but the next part is the important part. Um, let me give you a little history. When uh, I built our house in the late 70s, we went down 90 feet and hit um, like 80 gallons a minute of water. I mean, they couldn't keep up with it. So we figured we were safe, we could put in a backyard and the world would be fine. It didn't work, the, the water ran out. Apparently, it was the underground river that we had hit because they would bring up little round rocks when they were drilling. So we moved over about 10 feet and drilled again and hit a massive underground cavern. The guy almost lost his rig because it shot right down. So we had to move way into the back of our property and we went down 300 feet and got to water. And we had about 40 feet in the pool, they said, and now it's down to 20 feet because we had to put a new pump in. So I'm, nobody knows what's underground, even though they project there's different pools here and there. I don't believe that's true because of the fact we had an underground river. So I'm very concerned that these three new homes are going to drain us even farther. And the fact that the property hasn't been farmed is not true. I saw them farming it last summer. So I'm, this whole thing doesn't, it's all uh, designed in order to develop the three lots, P1, 
period, which I don't believe would be a good idea. Um, the restriction thing is, is a good idea for the 80 or 78 acres that they can keep that and not have it farmed at all. However, it sounds to me like there's still an avenue for it to change based on what you guys decide down the road. In the meantime, the people who are there and people who are beside it are at the whim of anybody. We could lose our property just like that because the well went dry. So I object to the farming, or putting the houses in, I'm sorry. Putting the houses in. Thanks okay. for being here. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that background. Does anybody else want to testify? No? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. What do you say? Yep, Lindsay, could you come back, please? <laughs> Okay. So, Madam Chair, if I may. Please. Lindsay, uh, I just want to clarify. So this, this hearing here is not about um, the water issue. It's about the land issue. Correct. And this is just to change the zone and the comprehensive plan. There is no proposal. There's no application in for uh, partitioning the parcels off. Um, there hasn't been a um, hydrogeology review for, for water supply, anything like that. This is just to change the comp plan and the zone. So at, at what point, um, that would be a whole nother process, correct? Correct. Okay. The applicant would have to come in with a partition application, which would require um, a hydro review to make sure that there's adequate water supply. And that's done by a professional hydrologist. Yeah. And so if there was not adequate water supply, then they would not be able to develop those lots. Is that correct? In theory, yes. Okay. In theory? In theory. Yeah. I <laughs> mean, it, it, it depends on what the hydrogeologist finds and if it, meets the if it meets or doesn't meet the criteria listed in the partition application or the, the code. So if it meets the code cr criteria and the requirements for that, then staff would approve it. There are methods for appeal because it is a land use case. Um, but if there was not an adequate water supply, you know, staff could deny it. But I don't know of any that we have denied based on that. We haven't had any come back that say there's no water. Because we have a lot of water here. So usually you can just go deeper, right? I mean, that's usually how that works. Yes. It, it just costs more because yes. you just have to go deeper. <clears throat> yes. Um, and then the other thing that I was hoping you'd clarify, because it, it sort of seemed like the board could go through a legislative process to redesignate the the, um, the 78 acres to farming in theory. But because of the nature of the comprehensive plan and the goal exception process, practically, that's like very unlikely, right? Because like if, if we just try to go and, and redesignate 80 acres of EFU somewhere, like immediately there's a lawsuit right. and we get stopped. Like it's not like, that's not like a, maybe there will be a lawsuit, like 100% <laughs> there will be a lawsuit, right? So, and, and uh, just the nature of the state's land use um, kind of policy doesn't really <coughs> contemplate that, right? It has a, the state's policies and goals have essentially a safeguard to protect specific lands designated for, say, farm use. So the applicant would have to find one of the reasons to, to say it's irrevocably committed, um, you know, or other reasons um, that this can't be farmed. Uh, you know, it's, it's on a rocky hillside or it's surrounded by single family homes and small lots and it's just right. a remainder parcel or something similar that w could pass the smell test. Right. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other questions? I don't have any other questions. No. Would the applicant like to provide any closing comments? Okay, yeah. great. So just for process clarity, do I close this section and because I don't see an action item on He's our agenda. Make a motion. I will make the Great, motion. you're going to do it. Okay, yep. perfect. So, Madam Chair, I move that we close the hearing, approve the request, and direct staff to prepare an ordinance consistent with the board's decision, not including the restrictive covenant on the farm parcel. I think I will second that motion. 
I did you make a motion to close the public hearing? He did. I did. Yeah. He did. Great. Okay. Great. I have a motion in a second. Is there any further discussion? Just okay. to clarify the board's motion. Is Would it, you move the microphone? Sorry. Too? Thank is you. the motion to approve the recommendation of the hearings officer with the ex with except to remove her recommendation for a restrictive covenant? Yes. Okay. That is. Okay. Yeah. That, it wasn't the hearings officer recommendation, but, but now that you clarified that. Okay. Okay. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you for your time and your work. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'm sure there's more processes to come. Have a good day. And who's going to read the calendar today? Do, you have any, do I have oh, any volunteers? I'd be happy to. Perfect. I love volunteers. <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, I will read the calendar today at noon, Marion County tour of the church and park. I think you're, I don't, uh, Commissioner Willis is going on that. I've got a meeting. I'm going to go Oops. for a bit of it. Okay, okay. good. Um, and then uh, at 1.30, a BOC CAO meeting back here in the commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor. Tomorrow, Thursday the 9th, work session on economic development and commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor at 9 o'clock. And tomorrow on the 9th at 4 p.m., the G3 Grand Opening, G3 Pizzas and Burgers in Main Street, Almsville, Oregon. Yeehaw. And then on the 14th, Tuesday, 7.30 a.m., Cities and Counties meeting nope. uh, one's at the Covered Bridge in Staten. We haven't been there in a while. That'll be good. Uh, on Tuesday, the 14th at 9.30, management update here in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor. On Tuesday, the 14th at noon, mid uh, Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, which is virtual. Tuesday to 14th at 1.30, work session on intergovernment agreement updates here in the fifth floor of Commissioner's Boardroom. On Wednesday the, at 9 a.m. Uh, the 15th, we're back here for our board session, and then on Wednesday at 1.15, a BOCCAO executive session if needed here on the fifth floor. Um, uh, just. Just to note, the BOCCAO uh, for today has been canceled. Uh, move to next week. Commissioner Willis is, I think, going strawberry hunting. I am going strawberry <laughs> hunting. I'm going up to the North uh, Willamette Research Center. Oh, they, I, I'm on the board up there. And right. They the are, advisory board? Yep. That's a fun thing. So they're doing that for like four or five years. Yeah. It seems like. yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go up there and see. They have a new uh, executive director. Mike retired last year. And Good so, guy, though. Yeah. So I'm going to meet the new new person. Who is it? You know, have, have okay. it. Yeah. They have a name I can't pronounce, so <laughs> you'll learn it today. I'll learn it today, and I'll let you know. <clears throat> Perfect. Anything else? Oh, good. Good day. Great day. Okay. Yeah. Meeting adjourned. All right. It's time for Local Roots, music from Northwest artists. Let's welcome today's guest, Boxing Day.